welcome to our Women in Football Leaders Breakout Session. Today we're going to be hearing the stories of women in football. It's amazing to see so many of you here. I know this has been a really popular session. Hopefully we'll squeeze in. Any seats next to you, squeeze up so any latecomers can join us as well. You've made the right choice being here for today's breakout session. We're in for a treat. We've got some fantastic stories that we're going to be hearing here today. Uh, my name is Gemma Frith. I am the presenter producer at Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club. I've been in football for six years now in a variety of roles, but as a natural born chatterbox, I'm now in my dream job as a presenter and I'm pleased today to be joined by four fantastic women who have completed the Women in Football Leadership course. Now completing my level one and two was a really big uh, career milestone for me. Back in just November I completed mine and I came away feeling a lot more inspired, empowered and able to assert myself in a, in a male dominated environment. And we've got four alumni of the course here today who had similar takeaway experiences. I'm looking around the room and I can see some face from, faces from my course as well um, and I'm sure lots of you have completed the course as well. If you haven't, I really, really do recommend it. Book yourself a place on our leadership course. I'll talk to your employees and get that to them set up for you because it's just fantastic. It's not just people in leadership positions. It's for anybody working in football as a woman. And honestly, if you've loved the uh, conference today, you'll absolutely love the course as well. But without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our four panellists here today. First, to my left, we have Danielle Gibson, who works in compliance in the women's professional game with the FA. We've got Lola Ogunbote, who's the head of women's football for Burnley. We've got Priya Kohli, who's the global digital category growth director for football at Adidas and also a non-executive director for the Lancashire FA. And we've also got Helena Bowman, who is the head of business operations and community at Middlesbrough FC. Now, we're going to start today by hearing their stories and their journeys to get to where they are today. And if you've taken the leadership course, you'll know that storytelling is a big part of the session. And we're hoping to sit back and hear some fantastic stories here today. They've all had incredible careers and journeys, and hopefully you'll be able to relate to them and, uh, and feel quite inspired by the end of today's session. We'd also quite like to make this as interactive as possible. So if we have time at the end, I know we're going to be a little bit tight on time, but it'd be great to answer your questions as well. So if there's anything that you would like to ask our panellists, get thinking while they tell their stories and we'd love to get around to answering your questions at the end. But without further ado, I'd like to start with Helena on the end there. Helena, please do start by telling us your story and journey, your fantastic journey to get to where you are today. Hi everyone. Um, so currently I'm head of business operations and community at Middlesbrough Football Club, which I have been in this role just over a year. Um, but I've actually been with the club for 16 years, so I graduated university, I went to Sheffield University and did a psychology degree. No idea at all what I wanted to do, but I've always, always been a massive football fan since I was young. Um, graduated, went home to Durham, proud northeast girl, and I was looking through the local paper, as you did then, for jobs, and there was a badge of Middlesbrough Football Club on a job advert, and this is really bad didn't really know what the job was, but it was a job in football, and I thought, well, I'm going to apply for that. Um, and it turned out it was a youth engagement worker with the foundation or Middlesbrough Football Club in the community at the time, the CCO. So I went into the interview. Um, I was a Newcastle fan, and I walked in, and my email address at the time had NUFC in it. <laughs> and I walked in, and the chairman of the foundation went, you can't have this job, you're a Newcastle fan. And I was like, and he was like, I'm just joking. It's actually better that you don't support Middlesbrough, was what he said, because I know that you're not here because you're a Middlesbrough fan. Um, went through the interview. They asked me why I wanted to teach in schools. Uh, I don't think I'd ever presented to children in my life at that stage. Um, but I got the job, and I started at Middlesbrough Foundation as a youth engagement worker. Loved it. After two years, I said to my boss at the time, you need to give me something else to do because I'm not challenged. And he, and he just give me something. It wasn't about pay, it was about just wanting something else to do to challenge me. So I became a senior youth engagement worker. And over a period of oh, 15 years, I had eight different roles at the foundation and I ended up as head of foundation uh, for five, six years until I joined the football club last year. Um, I did have, there was a time we got promoted in 2016 for that one year, hopefully again this year. Um, and the board of trustees brought in a chief executive above me at that time so I was sort of given the community manager job head of foundation job because there was a lot of redundancies and I was sort of the last person left standing and I just became the community manager no experience of running a business or a charity whatsoever um, and when we got promoted I remember my chair 
and another trustee who I'd built up a brilliant relationship with came in and said, oh, we're going to bring, bring in someone above you, a chief exec. And I am pretty stubborn. And it was a bit of fight or flight. And I was like, I'm going to dig my heels in here and I'm going to stay. Um, and within six months, the chief exec had gone. And I was back again as head of foundation with probably a you know what, it was awful at the time, but it was probably, I would do that now. And it wasn't a very nice thing to do to me, I guess, but it was absolutely the right decision because I'd never run a charity before and going to the Premier League brings a lot of funding to the charity and I wasn't experienced. And I can see that now at the time. I, I couldn't, but it's just, it's just a learning experience and it helps you develop to who you are today, in my opinion. Um, so I was head of foundation for six years and then the football club, they had a vacancy as a... Uh, the finance director left and I'm not pushy I'm rubbish at negotiating but I rang the chief exec and I said can't there's, there's something there for me you've got a gap in your leadership team I, what about me and he went you know what I've, I did think about you actually so we had conversations and then I was seconded to the football club in this role for six months whilst also being head of foundation and then someone else at the football club left and the chief exec said oh, I want you to come full time to be this role, head of uh, business operations and community, which, by the way, is sort of like a chief operating officer, just a different title, I would say. I've got community stuck on the end because it's something I'm really passionate about, being at the foundation for so long and influencing the local community of Teesside because we are the biggest brand in the area. That's really important to me and the club. Um, so I've been in this role for, yeah, a year and a half, and it's a big role I learn every day. I've got lots of heads of departments with brilliant different skill sets who are all experts in their fields like a groundsman who's worked there 25 years a safety officer who's worked there 25 years i've learned so much about football pitches it's unbelievable um <laughs> but i can't i can't know everything about everything that's their job to know their specific areas so my aim is to know probably 10 percent of, of all those departments that i've got um and just know to, when to challenge and ask the right questions to make sure we're doing things right um, and to lead the team, I guess. And one of the areas of my job I really enjoy is we, we, the club have never had a strategy, so one of the things I was brought in to do was to write a strategy for the football club, which actually is now off the ground. We've got core values, we're doing workshops with staff, which has never been done before. Um, and that's a bit I really, really enjoy about it. And then separate to that, I, I was on the board of North Riding County FA, I, I stood down from there last year after five years on that. Um, I chair a consortium lo locally, which is a three million pound art council funding project, which is all about getting art and creative art into the community. Um, I also chair my netball club locally as well. <laughs> so I, I like being busy, but I like the challenge and I love learning new things, which, and I feel <coughs> still very new to this job, um, even though it's a year and a half in. I did the Women in Football course October 2020, apparently, online, um, which was brilliant. And actually, we met on, on that, and we've never met in person. Um, but just the network of women that were on it were brilliant. And one thing I would say about it is I felt so safe, and I felt it was so confidential, because you could really talk about your experiences with, and know that it wouldn't go outside that online room. So that was one of the highlights of it. I'll stop Amazing. There. No, that's fantastic. A brilliant story. <laughs> you've, had, you've had a fantastic journey, and we've heard in some of the panels today about being able to see that route through from, from joining in an entry level position and then being able to see it all the way through to the head of the foundation is, is, an, inc is an incredible achievement. When you then made that move over from the foundation to the club, as someone that's in club football, I know that they're very separate, en separate entities at times. Is there a lot of differences between working for the charity side and then working for the club, club side? Yeah, so at the, well, firstly at the charity I was in charge, so that culture was m a culture that I was able to lead and decide on. So having a strategy and core values and driving things, I have com was in complete control of that. The, f the football club didn't, well, didn't have any of that um, because it's so much more in the limelight mm -hmm. and it is anything that we do will be judged social media posts, you know, we put something out and then there's thousands of comments, whereas the foundation, we put something out, you might get three or four, maybe. So you really have to consider the impact 
so uh, yeah i feel like we need to consider things not more but it's just consider that we have such a wider reach mm -hmm. the football club than the foundation so that is something different um but just culturally i feel like at the charity you could sort of be more open and talk more about things and know like you'd maybe have less not less opinionated people but people more open yeah. and transparent but that was because of the culture created at the charity so I suppose my job is to create that at the football club now. I also know that um, while you were with the foundation you uh, went back to education you completed a master's as well what is it like balancing uh, your career and, and progressing in in your industry but also balancing the education and making that decision to to continue your education alongside it as well? Yeah, so I was really, really set on academic qualifications. I was like really one of, like I just thought they were so important. Um, so I did a PGCE whilst at the foundation and I did a master's in education. I was head of education. That was one of my roles in the foundation. Um, I don't use that qualification at all in my job at the minute. I was, I became a single mum whilst doing my dissertation of my master's and that is my proudest achievement by a mile. I'd gone through a divorce. My daughter was two. I remember opening the envelope and it, well, it was online and it said you'd passed. And I think I burst into tears because it was such a, it was just a, such a hard time. But I think every experience builds your resilience and builds your character. And that is, has made me who I am now. And I think even in work, I am more resilient because of my personal life and what I've mm. been through. Um, so juggling it is just part of what I do. And I just, and I do it because I want to do it. And if I didn't want to juggle, I could stop doing all the voluntary things um, and play netball, but I, I don't want to, so I just manage through it. A lot of people talk about that work-life balance, particularly as a parent and as a mum. Actually, for International Women's Day, we had some conversations at Wolves, and one, someone that stuck in, my, stuck in my head from one of the women that I spoke to, which says that when she tells people that um, she's a mum, people immediately go to, oh, how do you juggle it? How do you manage it? How do you, you know? But actually, for her, it's such a driver, and it is the reason behind everything she does. It's the reason she is successful. Do you, would you say that that's the same for you? Yeah, it, like, so it is a selfish thing sometimes, because I want to be the best at what I do, and I want to do all these things, so that's why I do it. But I also know that my daughter, who's now nine, looks up to me and sees it and sees the drive, and hopefully she learns from that as well and also you know, you juggle what you want to juggle don't you like if I want to have a weekend with my daughter away out and miss some work event I, I choose to miss the work event and you just have to prioritize I guess Absolutely. Well, you are uh, absolutely flying at Middlesbrough. Fingers crossed for the rest of the season for Middlesbrough as well. Um, but thank you very much, Helena. Um, next, we'd like to hear from Priya. Please, Priya, tell us your story. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my story is quite different from Helena. I didn't know that I wanted to work in sport. Um, growing up, um, it was a very academic background that I come from. And so my parents were just like, focus on school. And sport was kind of like something that we messed around in, if I'm completely honest. So, um, but I loved school and I loved maths and I loved art. And I, I like, yeah. okay. We'll get some lights back, we'll get some lights back, don't worry. It's just dramatic, dramatic lighting for your story. That's what it is. Um, and so, but like, I, but the one thing I do remember, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I said to my parents, like, I don't want to become an accountant, a doctor, a lawyer, but I'll, I'll do something interesting. And I think the first thing that they did was just give me the freedom to be like, okay, you go do, find out what you want to do and do it. So um, if you love school and you don't really know what you want to do, I was like, well, I'll do an economics degree. I'll go learn something about business because that will be useful. Um, so I went to university and then my, one of my friends took me to a local leisure center and we went to together and I found it quite an intimidating place. But I remember the receptionist recognised me and she told she recognised and she called me by name and she was like, Oh, it's Bria, it's lovely to see you again. And I was like, Well, oh, isn't that fantastic? Little did I know there's a software called CRM which tells you when you tap your membership card that that's <laughs> <laughs> But that was my first like, oh, this is great. You feel part of something. Um, and then I saw a job for to work for that organization. It's a non-for-profit. And I was like, yes, I could imagine myself working in that, in that field and helping more people get healthy. Um, and then I stayed there for two and a half years and I wanted to progress. 
And I, there was, it was quite a small company, so you couldn't really, I either had to wait for my manager to leave or look elsewhere. Um, and then I got an interview, or I got a call from a, a recruiter hiring for Chelsea Football Club. And my, like, I was like, this is amazing, but I know nothing about football. I know digital marketing, because that was something that was really interesting for me, because it balanced, for me, the creative and the, num the numbers side. And it was just in its infancy, and it, was, and it gave me an edge because they were looking for someone with digital expertise. Because when I first joined Chelsea Football Club, they used to meet, all the Premier League teams used to meet the marketing teams and discuss what had worked for them and what hadn't. And so they weren't thinking about a global audience. It was very much local and how you fill a stadium. Um, and I found that incredible because I was like, in no other industry would you cut, go and sit with your competitor because they were like, well, if you had a great marketing campaign, it's not going to make an Arsenal fan become a Liverpool fan. Maybe, but maybe if you're in Asia, it might be different. So things that it was that stage in, in football. And so I joined Chelsea um, and my role was to help the team get more t savvy in digital. So we, we updated the website and then we upgraded our whole technology stack. So I got paid and learned at the same time, which for me was brilliant. Um, and I did that for four and a half years. I delivered the project that I was working on, on time and on budget, which was the only area that did, <laughs> that actually delivered. And then I was like, okay, I've seen the Premier League. And that was just like, for me, a game changer. Like I went to my first football game and I was just like, what is this? Why have I not been here before? And so, it was the Brazil World Cup, and I was like, if I've seen the Premier League, let me go and see what the World Cup would be like. Mm -hmm. And so I went with my sister, and we went for three weeks, and I was like, it was amazing. We were based in Rio. We saw games at, you know, in the fan zone. We managed to see two games in three weeks, but it was just like a party for football. And really, <coughs> everyone in, in Rio, in Brazil, all over, was just like glued to TVs when the matches was on, were on. And I was like, who gets to work on stuff like that? I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then when I came back to Chelsea, I caught a bit of a shock. Um, my boss called me in and I'm like, right, ready for my promotion. And uh, he was like, actually, I'm going to take away your team and I'm going to give you a project that I want you to work on alone. Um, and, and I was like, there was other things happening behind the scenes that, so I had a decision to make. Do I stay and feel like I had been given a bad hand, or do I look elsewhere? It wasn't my plan to, but then I was like, no, I'm, if, I'm fiercely loyal, but if I feel like I've been done wrong by, I'm out of there. So um, I started looking for a role, and I got an offer from Man City, because it was the job that I was hoping for at Chelsea, but in Manchester. So I was like, okay, well, I'll move to Manchester then. And then I got approached by a headhunter saying they're looking for a role of someone who would work for a sports company. They didn't say who it was. Later I found out it was Adidas and my gut was like, I wonder if it is. So I turned down Man City without having any job secured because I was like, either you do the same or you try something completely different. So it was a complete leap of faith, but it the best decision I made. Min moving to Germany, um, where, where I, be, I moved there eight years ago, and it was when they had just signed Manchester United, so the other side of the city. Um, <laughs> and it was three months later, so we set up a CRM program for uh, Man Manchester United and Adidas uh, before we had a membership team, before anything of that like existed. And then it was funny, like my old bosses then rang and said, you're doing this for Manchester United, why aren't you doing it for Chelsea? I was like, oh my God, I wanted to try and do this when I was there. But I did it for two years and it was a pilot project and then they said, okay, it goes back to sports marketing. And then for me, I was like, well, what do I do now? Because I've done so much and data was super interesting for me. So I moved into analytics and I did that for four years working with tra in training in Adidas, like on a global role because I was like, I actually want to learn a little bit more. Maybe I can do more in sport. And then COVID hit. And um, I, I loved my job, but I was like, I miss football. And I remember after the first lockdown in Germany, I picked up Anna Kessel, Kessel's book because I started listening to podcasts and all kinds of stuff. Like, because you have the time to kind of like think about what it is that you want to do instead of just being on that uh, hamster wheel. And I cried reading that book because I was just like, it's not just 
me. Um, and then I found out about women in football and I did the leadership course and then I found actual real women just like us. And some of them are here today. Again, I'm seeing for the very first time. And it gave me the courage to be like, actually, no, I need to go back to football. I'm not quite done yet. And I didn't know if it would be in my day job. So when we were on the course, we talked about non-exec roles. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, a post that came up with a Lancashire FA. And I, it made me realize, actually, I'd always worked at the very top of football. But what, I'd, what had I done to grow the game? So that's why I applied. And Simon and his team that he's created there are incredible. Like if, if I look around on the board, it is a 50-50 split in gender, but also the diversity of thought and the leadership that you have within the Lancashire FA is incredible. And if they're the biggest county FA, then that gives me real big hope for how we can change the game. Um, and then this job, or that a current job that I've got, which is now within digital growth within football, appeared and I put my hand up. And I was like, let me put my name in the hat. And um, I'm very, very grateful that they said yes. They took a, they took a, a, you know, a bit of a chance on me because I didn't fit the regular mold. Um, and they always just thought of everyone who interviewed, interviewed me was just like, your analytics, Priya. And I'm like, yeah, there was, they didn't know about my career beforehand. So I would definitely say try. And then I've been in my current role for just over a year. And we, you know, the, the end of the story is that basically we've got a fantastic team there now. Sometimes the timing isn't right when you join an organization and maybe you, you get knockbacks. But if you're, if you're thinking the right way, your time will come. So uh, now I, I can have a whole team beside me who are you know, driving football forward. And we went to the World Cup. We were there for a whole month. And um, it was the most incredible experience of my life. Um, also the most intense <laughs> working experience <laughs> of my life. Like for a month, we didn't stop working, but the result was incredible. So um, that's all thanks to the course that we did. Amazing. That's absolutely incredible. Round of applause, please, for Priya. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic story. And what stands out to me, and I'm sure for a lot of people in the audience, is the amount of courage to make so many leaps of faith throughout your career, particularly, you know, at first, turning down the Manchester City job, you know, going from making a move to Manchester to making a move to Germany, then moving to the <laughs> Netherlands, you know, and, and it's good to hear that a lot of that has potentially come, particularly more recently, from your experience on the, on the leadership course. How much would you put it down to that and actually perhaps just, you know, being really courageous and, and always having it, that, that belief within you that you can just go and, and, and get those roles? I'm quite a timid person, really. <laughs> but I think being on the course and finding your allies and finding peers and also having like the experts teach you the tools like of how you get ahead because nobody actually tells you that you just kind of like struggle and make your way through it and just think like if you do a good job you'll be noticed and then you get up to the next level but actually there's ways that you can leapfrog mm. so I would say a hundred percent of it is due to the course because if I hadn't have been on the course I wouldn't have been brave enough I don't think certainly not for the LFA and even for the, for, the, for the role at Adidas, probably I, I would have like second guessed myself. Amazing. Well, it's, you've had a fantastic career and we're looking forward to seeing what happens next as well. I'm sure this is not the end. Um, and thank you for coming all the way from the Netherlands to be here today as well. <laughs> That's an incredible, potentially the furthest journey. I'm not sure if anyone else has come as far as that to be here today, but um, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Priya. Uh, Lola, over to you. I know you've got some great stories, so I'm looking forward to hearing this one. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, but yeah, please tell us your story to, to now. No? Yes? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no pressure at all. Um, I think for me, um, just to get context, it's important just to start from the beginning. And so I'm Nigerian by birth. And if anyone has had any contact with Nigerians or Nigerian parents, you probably know the direction that the story is going to go. Um, I started out in the east, east of London. I grew up in, in borderline Essex, but I call it East. I'm, I'm, I'm from Barking. And um, I just loved playing football. Um, that wasn't inherent from family or friends. None of my parents or siblings play the game. Uh, my parents uh, were first generation uh, immigrants to the country, left Nigeria for a desire to have a better life for them and for their children. And that's really important because in my journey, um, playing football was not 
what they had planned for me at all. Um, and so I played at a decent level. I, I had a scholarship to go abroad and they did not sign the paperwork. Um, and I wasn't able to go. And I remember at 16 just feeling really angry, actually, that this opportunity had been taken away from me. Um, I then towed the line and went to school and went to university. I studied law. I qualified as a barrister, a real barrister, not a barista. <laughs> <laughs> and um, towed my wig and gown and prosecuted cases on behalf of the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, I worked in Canary Wharf. I lived that lifestyle and ended up at Goldman Sachs, which is, um, well, as most of you know, a big financial institution. And so I was um, living that lifestyle and making a lot of money and earning well, and my parents were happy. And I remember, actually, they threw me a, a Goldman Sachs party. That's how much they were really just, <laughs> you know, over the moon with this achievement. Um, my parents, you know, were really supportive and paid f outright for my education, um, both university and law school. And I, I mentioned that because um, at Goldman Sachs, I had a chance meeting with Rachel Yankee, who at the time was like just my idol. And I remember she was in Goldman Sachs. No one knew who she was. She was just looking really lost. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, it's Ra Rachel Yankee. What is she doing here? <laughs> totally fan girl beeline for her and I was like hi Rachel and um, she was like hi I was like are you lost and she's like yeah a little bit and I was like where do you need to go she's like I need to go to this one I was like oh, can I take you she's like yeah sure and I'm sure she was thinking this, this isn't a good idea but um, we got into a lift and, and we had two minutes and I, I just said to her look I've always loved playing football didn't really have the support that I felt that I should have do you think it's too late for me to make a, a, a go of it and she was like absolutely not you should, you should go for it and that day, really impulsively, I was like, I quit, I quit my job. I'm gonna quit my job because <laughs> Rachel Yankee told me I could. <laughs> and um, I remember having a conversation with my boss being like, look, you know, I, I wanna follow this trajectory, I wanna go, and he was like, you know, you're, you're, you're on the track to go and make it as a partner in this organization. Like, you're really bright, you've got a bright future ahead of you, are you sure, is everything okay, do you need help? Um, <laughs> I was like, no, this is just this is just what I want to do. And I remember quitting the job and then like the adrenaline being like, yeah, I'm going to make it. I'm going to do this. And then being like, wait, I've got to bring this to my parents. I've got to actually figure out what I'm going to do to make money. This actually wasn't the smartest idea. Um, and I remember on a train ride home opening up um, a paper and it had an ad for a program with Arsenal Football Club, which obviously is the best second best club in the world. I've got my... Um, very lovely chairman from Burnley sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but he knows I'm a massive Arsenal fan. So I, I, I was like, this, is a, this, is, this has got to be a sign. I've seen a paper advertising for a job for the, the club that I've loved and supported all my life. I'm going to apply. I applied on, I think, the Friday. Um, and then by the next Tuesday, I'd been invited in for an interview. And by the Thursday, I had a job with Arsenal Football Club coaching in the community. The programme really was to teach people who hadn't had um, coaching skills, how to coach. Um, so we spent the first six months coaching, learning those fundamentals, doing your level one, level two. And then the second six months was coaching on their behalf out in their um, partner programs. So I spent time in, in Mozambique, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe and Australia. And at the end you get an award. They, they, there was a cohort of people. I was of course the only female on that cohort. And um, the players gave me um, a coach of the year award. And I remember I've got a picture of me standing at the murder sack. I think I've just about reached his belly button. Um, <laughs> Aaron Ramsey, Theo Walcott, and Danny Welbeck. And it, that was a moment that I felt like this was worth it. And, and what I should say is obviously having quit my job and working for Arsenal that year was, was voluntary, so I had to support myself. And so we would wait, I'd wake up at nine, um, coach from nine till five. I'd, I'd go home from North London to Essex. I'd get home at six, have my dinner at seven. And then I would get back on the bus to Liverpool Street to start a night shift at Tesco from nine. And that would finish at five the following morning. And I did that for a year. I took cleaning jobs. I did everything I could. And there's nothing wrong with those jobs, of course. But I did everything I could to support myself, knowing full well that I wasn't going to be able to use the bank of mum and dad, who were pretty upset anyway, <laughs> and at a financial <laughs> loss. <laughs> um, so... I, uh, I, I did that and, and coached, um, loved every bit of it, and then felt like 
this was the springboard to go on and do more. I then took a job in China. I lived in Beijing for three years as a technical director of a tw under 21s academy out there, coached there, set up a first female um, recreational women's team that, that traveled over Asia and competed. And we started off with four players. Um, that the WeChat group, which is the, the Chinese equivalent of WhatsApp, has 222 players and they still play up until this day. And I take great pride in the fact that I had a hand in creating that and it still goes on. Um, I then, you know, volunteered and I think this is something that everybody should um, try and do is, is volunteer and network and I know we talked about pay before but where it is possible just to get a feel of what it is you want to do um, I've always wanted to set up my own charity I wanted to set up an organization that could help girls um, in less privileged parts of the world and be in Nigeria and that was a massive part um, and desire of mine and so I wanted to set up a, pro a program I, I googled names, I came across an organization that was kind of doing the same work. I, I emailed and said, I want to volunteer. And I came out and volunteered. And I remember the executive director at the time was like, Lola, you, you know, you're, you're doing a lot. You've, you're volunteering from China. You're coming to the US. You're volunteering with our programs. What is it that you want? And how can we help you? And I just looked at it and I said, can I be really honest? And she said, yes. I said, I just want your job. <laughs> I, I, that's actually what I want. I want to be the executive director of this organization. And she kind of looked at me and she was like, well, that's not going to happen. But um, you can continue <laughs> volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and um, as luck would have it, or fate, however you believe in it, um, she got headhunted and left the organisation, called me and said, remember that time you said that you wanted my job? Um, if you still want it, it's yours. And I took it, and um, I am the executive director of Goals for Girls, and I know there's one in the UK, but this one is an American um, organisation. We use football to unite girls and make leadership changes in their lives. We have programs in Cameroon, um, in the US, in Nigeria, in India. We're just in India for the U17 World Cup. Um, and we have plans to open up in Egypt. And it's really a big part of me trying to give back to people who probably would, or I would be in their circumstances had my parents not taken the move to, to move to the UK. Um, I also then um, came back to the UK and got in touch with with the chairman of Burnley, who I've, I've known for a long time, and he had just acquired Burnley and, and was interested in trying to set up and professionalise what was a community team, um, and asked me whether I would be interested in kind of supporting that, and I'd absolutely jumped at the chance and started off with doing kind of their business coordination, and, and then last year was, was promoted to being the head of women's football, and in a, in a place, in an industry that's not um, necessarily div diverse in terms of gender, and then for me as a black woman as well, um, I, I was very, it was a moment for me to just step back and be like that girl that used to kind of kick it with the boys and have grazed knees and broken shoes is suddenly an executive director of one organization and a head of women's football in another. Um, and I think the pinnacle moment for me was during the Euros when I was asked to do, be, an authoritative voice on primetime television on on BBC One. I remember doing BBC One in the morning, ITV in the afternoon, and Channel Five in the evening. Oh, wow. And um, having a message from my dad, who I love to bits and is just an incredible human, saying to me, "I got it wrong, um, and I'm sorry, and um, I'm so proud of you." And those were words that I think, being in my grown age. Um, I desperately wanted to hear and trying to navigate not feeling like I disappointed them um, and coming to a, sp a space where you know he I, I think he speaks about Burnley more than I do to everybody <laughs> that he met he meets he's like oh yeah my daughter she's the head of women's football at Burnley and I'm like do you even know who Burnley is dad um, <laughs> he's like, I don't care and it's just it, it's just been a fantastic a fantastic journey for me and I think when I came to do the leadership course, the reason I chose to do it, despite the fact that I've done an undergrad and I've got a master and I've been to law school, was I wanted to have tangible knowledge of what it takes to lead from that perspective. And I remember um, meeting with Ebru and, and Monique and, and listening to them and feeling really inspired them with my cohort as well. And that's, that's helped me to be on, on panels like today. If not for the leadership course, I wouldn't be here today. Um, through links with with Ebru, I've been able to speak at the World Football Summit in Seville and in and in Johannesburg and in Durban, and those kind of opportunities come, and that's what I think is necessary is the networking. And if you have come here and you're still with the same people that you've arrived with, then you're doing it wrong. Go and speak to people that you haven't 
spoken to before, go and link with people, ask questions. People are genuinely willing to help. You've got some that will tell you that they will help and never call you back. But <laughs> um, genuinely, people are here to help. And if there is anything, of course, in my capacity that I can, I can do, I love to mentor young, young women and give them the belief that, you know, I'm no different. If I can do it, absolutely, you can. Um, and I hope to continue that path. And we've got exciting plans at the club for Burnley and obviously you know the men's are flying and, and we want to be at the women's team we're also doing extremely well and long may that continue and, and also um, I'm lucky that I'm also able to balance ish my work with Goals for Girls and so I get to to be with a child that's never played football before in the slums of Mumbai and bring football to that girl and bring hope to her in the same way that I'm able to push and challenge my captain at Burnley to be the best version of herself that she can be and so I count myself extremely lucky, extremely blessed, extremely uh, privileged to be in a position where I can do that and I have and I feel personally a, a personal responsibility that I in turn reach down and try and help others um, and so it's it's been a marvellous journey and um, I know it's just the beginning and there's so much more to do and I'm somebody that's never content with staying still, I'm always moving and always trying to do more um, to my detriment at times but it's just fulfilling and I remember speaking to my mum not too long ago and it was kind of morbid, but not intentionally. But I was like, do you know what? If I was to die today, I'd be pretty happy. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, I genuinely would have no complaints because I've fulfilled what I think is my purpose in life. Um, and that's, I never thought I'd be in that position at all. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I hope everybody in this room is able to experience at some time if they're not already experiencing it. And that as a network, we, we uplift each other. Um, and that, that we're here to support one another. And that's what I found that the leadership course was just that support of me as Lola, as a person <coughs> from the East End of London in Essex with skinny, skinny legs and lovely knees. And so if I can do it, definitely anyone else in this room can. Absolutely amazing. What an incredible story. <laughs> that, that Rachel... That uh, Rachel Yankee story is something out of a, of a film. I'm sure there'll probably be a film made one day, a book maybe, written. Maybe. You should write a book. An absolutely incredible story. You have achieved so much. It has blown me away. I thought I'd done loads of research. I didn't know half of that. It's absolutely incredible, everything that you've achieved and you're continuing to do with, with Goals for Girls and, um, and with Burnley as well. Burnley are neck and neck in the league at the moment with Wolves women, so I know, know just how well you are doing at the moment. <laughs> and I'll be keeping, keeping a close eye. Hey, um, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions for you at the end as well. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move straight on to Danielle so that you can ask some of those, um, those questions. But Danielle, please do share with us your story. No pressure following on from those. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was going to say well, th thanks for putting me after Lola. I'm yeah, like, sorry. Hello, this. Um, so I guess where I start my journey was I, similar to Lola, just played football since I was seven. A little tomboy. No one told me I couldn't. Um, so I often found in the playground with, with the boys. Until one day, uh, I remember going to a, a sports centre on a Saturday, and there was a girl playing with a boy, with the boys team. So I just mum take me there now mm -hmm. so I was really lucky in that where I grew up and where I went to school I, I was allowed to play with the boys and um, so football was just in me from a really young age um, but I was usually the, the only girl in and around in and around that environment um, but also similar to, to what Lola said is my pet probably without telling me my parents probably did put the kind of conventional pressures of you know they, they I'm so lucky they had it. I had a great education. They, they really wanted me to have the best in life. So I felt probably that had to be, you know, good on conventional route of, you know, education first, um, you know, future career. Um, but on the side of that, I always played football. So um, I'm from the from the northwest. So I played for Everton back in the back in the old days when I could when I found a, a girls football team up there who we used to play against Burnley as well. <laughs> um, and, you know, followed after school, went to university. Um, a, couple of, a couple of anecdotes from a football point of view there is my, um, I think I played in, in varsity for Leeds Uni against Steph Horton. So that was like back then, one of those like moments of, you know, in the f looking back now, thinking, wow, that was one of those. Um, and I was also fortunate to get to like a, an England training level where um, I was in the same squad as Enya Luco and Karen Carney, so I followed their careers, you know, really um, like vivid, uh, vividly. I'm so like proud of where they've got to, and 
obviously part of me is like, oh, I wish that was me. Um, <laughs> but I also suffered uh, injuries quite early on. Um, the, probably the key one for me was playing for Everton. We were in a cup final at Goodison Park, but we weren't allowed to wear football boots. So we, we had to wear trainers and the pitch was wet. So I twisted my ankle and then uh, didn't really get any you know, proper recovery from that. So always suffered. So managed to you know, keep playing football whilst <coughs> through education. Um, and like I said, at uni. Um, but then when I finished university, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So just you know, went to the careers fair and ended up in a job in accountancy, um, mm -hmm. uh, training and audit. And I don't know if many of you have much to do with auditors and what you do, but you know, not many people are major fans of us. <laughs> but what it does give you is good business knowledge um, and going out into, into the business world and understanding how things operate in different industries. So can't really complain from, from that side. But what I did whilst I was training to be a chartered accountant is I went back to Liverpool Ladies and, and played um, with them um, as part of that process because I was an accountant. Uh, one day um, the, the club set came to me and said, um, unfortunately our current treasurer is, is ill um, and he's, he's um, having to step away from, from doing any extra work. And he was one of the players' fathers who unfortunately um, had a terminal, ended up with a terminal illness. So he asked me, you know, could, do you mind stepping in doing the bookkeeping on a, voluntarily, on a voluntary basis? So obviously I said, of course, I'll help out. So I spent my evenings after work and around training, doing the bookkeeping, you know, paying some of the coaching staff, uh, paying the, the buses, um, paying invoices. Um, and then along comes this thing called the WSL, uh, <laughs> where we, I obviously had to submit a pretty detailed in-depth license application to, to want to be able to play in that league. So um, I'm kind of proud now to look back and say I was actually uh, helped Liverpool get into, get into the Super League. Um, don't know if you know much about history, but the first two seasons weren't great where we finished bottom. But I think what the, the good side from there is that we were um, a complete like independent company. We were at back then called the CIC where we just told Liverpool, you know, we spent this much money this month, um, they'll give us the money to pay for it and you can use our kit, but you don't really get any other support from us. So in 2013, the, the club actually brought the women's team in-house and, and created a subsidiary company. So um, as part of that process, I just finished qualifying as, a, as an accountant. Um, and also, if anyone knows anything to do with audit, you know, don't want to stick around in there <laughs> for, for very long. Um, so I just handed my CV in and said, you know, if you've got any accountancy jobs, finance jobs going in, in, in the club or for the women's team, um, uh, here's mine, P please consider me. And probably within two or three weeks, I had a phone call from the finance team in LFC um, offering me basically a job in the finance department. But it was in the men's finance department and um, I basically stepped away from anything to do with running the, the women's team during that transition. Um, and at this point in time, I am... Um, working for Liverpool FC five days a week, training um, with the women's team two nights a week, playing on a Sunday, and also failed to mention I am a massive Liverpool fan and have a season ticket, so <laughs> going to Anfield on the, sun on the Saturday, so it's like seven days a week was just Liverpool FC. Um, <laughs> so, you know, on paper, absolute dream job. Yeah, you know, I'm an accountant, I'm in, I'm in the office, I'm getting to wear the shirt, um, but... I always knew from a playing point of view that I was never going to be able to prioritise that or commit to that um, if it's you know, 10, 15 years younger, sign me up right now. But um, I stepped back from playing football. Um, it was uh, probably one of the hardest, not hardest things, but regrettable decisions. Um, I really wish I'd pushed playing since a teenager much more. Like, like Lola said, you had that chance to go to university in America. I, I also did that, but I didn't get that far down line. I just decided, no, I best stick to what I'm supposed to be doing um, in the UK um, with what my parents have, have done for me. So I never went to, to America. So fast forward seven, year, seven years and I'm still in the finance department of Liverpool, mostly on the men's side. Um, you know, a lot of people, like, probably like Helena said, you know, see a, a, a job application or a, a vacancy with a club name on it, a badge on it. And, a lot of people um, will jump at the chance to be in a football club, but not necessarily all there because of they want to be there for that work. It's more 
the, the, the brand and what that, what that brings with it and those benefits. So on paper, I'm an accountant in my dream job. I'm not going to leave and be an accountant somewhere else in finance because why would I want to do that? But after seven years, I'm not really maximising my potential. Um, I've got not necessarily hit a ceiling, but there wasn't really anywhere else for me to go within the club. I'd, I'd done a lot um, for them. But the good news is the women's team's now back in the radar mm -hmm. and I get offered the chance to pick the financials back up for the women's side. And for me, um, you know, in this room when that happened during that conversation, it was, um, if you can pick the women's accounts up alongside your day job, don't spend too much time on it because it's, it's you know, it's, it's not, not worth it. Because this is, say, five years ago. And that's not how I work. I'm, you know, if I'm doing something, I'm doing it properly. So I really try to push within the club, um, you know, can you help your expertise um, and sometimes knocking on doors and, and from that side it's got to come from the top, you know, the CEO level down to get people um, to do the right thing and a lot of football clubs, probably similar in the women's game, it's as, as Lola might have experienced or hopefully not, is they're just a team over there, mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not our day job, our day job this football club here. So, um, as well as doing the finances, um, we had a change in, in structure at, at the club and a new board took over the women's team, which meant a lot more focus on it. So I, I got a further opportunity to go on to comment into the women's game full time um, to look at strategy and really use my connections and networks I built up in, in the club over the, the seven or eight years now to um, bring the main club closer to the, to the women's side you know let's tap into all these experts we already have that run a football club really well and use that to, to apply that to, to the women's game you know simple things as membership offerings um, we have a fixture calendar on an app for the men's team but a blank page for the women's team you know things like that aren't hard it's just has anyone asked the question um, you know is it just down to time or resource it's, it's really simple wins and then building up um, to the bigger picture and where do you want where do you want your women's team to go it's not just ticking a box mm. so as I said I was on, on to comment doing that um, and during that period or maybe just before actually is when I did the leadership course so um, I say September you say October 2020 <laughs> um, in Covid on Zoom online um, opportunity to, to, to meet you know brilliant women in this industry with totally different experiences and from today you know you might have five ten minute conversations with people um but the leadership course gives you that real time with these people to get to know them really well um and and really understand um you know the other other uh, ways of working out there what i really took away from that was um how to work collaboratively how to understand how teams work, what, you know, learning about people's weaknesses and strengths and how you can then work yourself in that situation as well. Um, and again, from network point of view, it's been um, brilliant. Like, uh, you know, as when I needed to have been able to tap into Monique, Jane, um, and also the connections that they've also helped me speak to as well along the way. Because um, just after the leadership course and being in the, uh, being a massive common in the women's game, you know, it's as we all know now, it's a huge trajectory. So I um, ended up, after Massa Comment, moving to the FA in the women's game in summer. Um, and again, that was an opportunity, opportunity only came to me because of, of people I met through Women of Football. Um, I actually kind of rang up Kelly Simmons going, anything, anything you know about jobs in football in the women's game? And I only met Kelly because of being this event last year. Um, so now I find myself in the WSL at the best time we could possibly be here because it's booming, you know, there's so much to do, the, te the team needs to grow um, because, um, you know, all, that, all eyes are on, 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 rightly so, on the women now and we, our job now is to do the, the best we can for the, the professional teams um, and the great thing about it is that everyone in the team that I work with is doing the job because they're passionate mm -hmm. about women's football and doing the right thing for the women's game. So we've all got that in common. So it's really, really great team to be in and be a part of on the journey. Um, and it's only gonna 
<laughs> get crazy. Well, it already, is, already is crazy, but it's gonna, only going to go even more crazy the next few years. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daniel. Once again, please, a round of applause. Another fantastic story, and, and actually hearing that you've gone from uh, from a player to be able to, when you retire, actually then moving into the club in a in a, in a position that you know you studied at university and being able to apply your finance knowledge into the club that you played for is perhaps a, a career path that you don't see when you start out playing. You don't think if you're going to be a footballer or you've got to quit it all and, and do something else similar to what Lola when you were a lawyer. You know, that thinking that they're kind of two separate things. Where actually, the fact that you've been able to bring it all together and um, is is just fantastic. Um, we are running really close to the end. We've had some fantastic stories here today, but I will take a couple of questions from the audience before I get pointed at to, to stop. Um, so if anyone would like to ask any questions to any of our four panellists, Helena, Priya, Lola or Danielle, please raise your hand. Any questions? Oh, Ooh. no questions? Question, oh, question here, perfect. <laughs> Um, hello, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, so you've all obviously had different experiences at different companies. Um, my question is aimed at all of you. <laughs> um, when you're like leaving company or going to a new team or moving on, like, what advice would you give? Like, how to leave your legacy in place and like develop? Like, so like when you leave, your work doesn't stop. Like, what advice would you give someone who's like moving on? to make sure their work continues. And mine's really interesting because I went from MFC Foundation to MFC, so MFC Foundation are on the other side of the building to me and I work very closely with the head of foundation. I would just say, I suppose it's the culture you've created and the, the people who you work with immediately. The people in the management positions in my team knew more than me in their roles and could advise me and I think it was a strong team that I'd left, so I knew that they were able to continue that sort of legacy, I guess. But it was really important the new head of foundation was able to make her mark as well. Um, so I suppose just doing the job as best you can is a legacy, but also the people that you leave behind. Can I just add very yeah, quickly, obviously, yeah, yeah. you know that football is a very small world. And so what that means is there's a higher probability in this sector than any that you'll run into people that you've worked before. And so for me, looking at it from a different perspective is to make sure that you leave relationships in the best possible form um, as possible, if that is appropriate. There are times where it's not and you just have to you know, do you and leave. But I think where, where you can is to, is to, I always think, well, if I'm not in the room, what will be said about Lolo and Bote? And nine times out of 10, maybe eight times out of 10, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm confident that it's going to be good things because I've conducted myself in a way that is, is professional. I've just treated people how I'd, I'd wanted, wanted to be treated. And I think that's uh, uh, maybe uh, an off the pitch or a softer skill that, that can take you quite far in life and in football. Brilliant. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm so sorry that we've come to the end and not been able to answer any more <laughs> questions, but these guys have told us some fantastic stories. So hopefully they've been very thorough in telling about their experiences about the Women in Football Leadership course as well. Hopefully that has inspired you to book on if you haven't already, or if you've done one and two, complete three and four. Um, but once again, please, a round of applause for our four panellists.